Hi, welcome to Blessed Hope Forever. I'm Steve. On Wednesday night, we're talking about things uh, could be anything. On Sunday, we've been studying through the 2 Corinthians verse by verse, so I invite you to join us there on Sunday. We are getting ready to move into August. Uh, September 17th is Feast of Trumpets. Uh, I've been meaning to do an update on our timeline. I believe that the dates going along a timeline beginning September 17 is at least worthy of taking note. And so that's where we're at as far as prophecy is concerned. As many of you, as many of you know, I, uh, one of my favorite topics, one of my favorite subjects, one of my uh, it just seems to be an und un undying endeavor of mine that I speak concerning law and grace. Law versus grace. Grace versus law. I don't uh, know how to, what kind of a, a reason really that I can give you for, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't know, I don't really have the words to describe just how important a topic I think that is. And the reason for that is simple. It's because uh, one works, one doesn't. And uh, one offers peace and joy and rest and contentment and, and thanksgiving and, and so on and so forth. The other really doesn't have much to offer at all except uh, despondency, hopelessness, helplessness, despair, confusion, doubt, and worry. Many of my brothers and sisters are immersed in that uh, fabric of legalism that's uh, existed since the church began. And I think there are a lot of interesting parallels between our Lord's ministry and ours. Obviously, they would be the same. If they were contrary one to another, it would seem awful odd. Uh, and so I want to talk a little bit about that. I know many of you are probably tired of hearing it. Uh, I never get tired of talking about it, so that's just, you know, the way it goes. Uh, you know, if you... If, uh, if you think you've already heard all this before, just, you know, you're welcome to, uh, to uh, click off this video and go somewhere else and do something else. I am always going to have something to say, and probably in a strong way, against law keeping as a rule of life. We are not under law, but under grace, we've never been under law. The church was never given the law, and there's a lot of confusion among Christians today as well as there, ha as, well, there has been ever since the church began concerning this issue of law versus grace. There's confusion. There's, there's misunderstanding. There's a lot of accusations uh, thrown back and forth, a lot of arguments, a lot of debates. So maybe, just maybe, that what I have to say in this video will uh, encourage you to study a little deeper on the subject, to be more interested in the subject, uh, to come to realize how important the subject is, and uh, just the effect that it has not only in our present lives, but in the life to come. It will make a difference. When grace faced law, that's what I want to talk about. So to a great extent, our ministry is polemical. Now, if you look that up in the dictionary, it means expressing or const constituting a, strong, a strongly critical attack or, or controversial opinion about someone or something. Polemic. Our Lord's ministry, which is... I guess you could say it was the probably you would have to say it's it was the purpose what for him, him coming in the first place. It was largely polemical, as is ours. They they couldn't be contrary to one another. 
our lives are not our own. 1 Corinthians 6. For me to live is Christ, Philippians 1. Not I, but Christ, Galatians 2. We become like Him, uh, Romans 8. Christ is our life. Our life is Christ. Our conversations, Christ. There were several Jesus confrontations, uh, you know, legalism being the most prolific. And the severity of it led to his crucifixion. Therefore, it properly defines the very heart of his life and ministry. And that ministry was and is, even today, one of grace. Law confronted grace. And, and grace stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with law. Toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Christians today still express a strongly critical attack or controversial opinion about someone or something. Uh, most ministries today are polemical to some extent, to some degree. In fact, in fact, the social fabric of society itself is mostly polemical. So we shouldn't find this unusual. The ministry, and I put that in quotes, of the chief scribes and, and priests, uh, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, uh, uh, as well as Jews in general, who confronted our Lord, their ministry was polemical but so was our Lord's. Just a, a casual reading of Scripture shows which side of the fence that we are all on when it comes to this matter of law versus grace. Because the Word of God judges the intentions of our heart. Note what the text does not say doesn't say that we judge the intentions of hearts. doesn't say that. Our hearts are, or the hearts of others. The truth is man doesn't even judge his own heart. I think it is a ridiculously foolish thing for law to accuse grace of being judgmental. But that's what it often does. I mean, law itself is judgmental. So it reverses it. It throws that same thing back at you. You know, wouldn't it, wouldn't it seem just a bit odd, folks, if our Bibles said that grace and truth came through Moses, but law came through Jesus Christ? Humans, we humans, we look at outward appearances, but the Lord looks into the heart. 1 Samuel 16. You know, a person may think that their, their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart, Proverbs 21. It is very much a heart issue here. And I figure I have heard most of the arguments. I'm sure there's some I haven't, but I want to talk about a few of those. I could begin with uh, this one. Well, Steve, I know we're not under Old Testament law, but we are under the law of Christ. We're under a, a New Testament law. It's, that's probably the most common response to grace. And if they can't persuade you with that baseless argument, then they assault grace itself. Well, grace leads to careless living. Grace leads to licentiousness. Well, the fact is it doesn't. We're saved by grace. But if that doesn't straighten you out, well, it might be something like, uh, well, we should strive to be more like Jesus. Uh, 
which, which clearly makes a confession of law, not grace. The opposition Christianity has always faced has been a conversation void of grace. The conversation of law has no room for grace. Uh, though the word grace is widely thrown about, and if all the above fails, and you know they whip out the sword of obedience, you know, well, the word says obey. But do you know what the word obey means? So if that doesn't cut you clear down to the bone, then they decapitate you with, well, we got to keep His commandments. Got to keep His commandments. And again, they, I'm, I'm not sure they understand what the word keep means and what it is exactly we keep. Now, if that one doesn't drop you to your knees of repentance, well, there's always, well, our bodies are a temple of the Holy Ghost. Uh, which, is, uh, which is an often misunderstood and, and misquoted verse used by many uh, a pastor to control their flocks and to keep them in bondage to law. And of course, if, you, if you're still not repentant at this point, you know, well, then they, they kind of go to scraping the bottom of the barrel here by bringing up the word do. Well, surely, surely you can't, can't get out of avoiding that one. You know, the do word. I mean, the Bible's full of do's. The word do and, and don't. Okay, so... Can't wiggle off that hook. I mean, uh... until in a final ditch effort, they kind of drop the napalm on your love for the God of all grace by kindly reminding you or maybe not so kindly reminding you, of the mood of command in the grammar. Well, the, the imperative mood of command. I mean, Steve, I mean, why, oh why, if we're not under law of some sort, why are there commands in the Bible? Why, why do we have imperatives if we're not under law? Some of those arguments can be very convincing. Now folks, I don't mean to sound overly critical. These are all good questions. Many which are being asked by sincere, God-loving Christians. You know, it's, it's been rightly said, you know, that you, you, know you, you can't get them under grace by putting them under law. And I, and I could not agree more. I couldn't agree more. But what is equally true is you cannot bring about righteousness in my life by putting me under law. That won't work. And so the centuries-old debate rages on, fueled by both a love for the truth and an ignorance of it, which, despite how it appears on the surface, 
is as normal a thing, folks, as anything ever was. Because these two conflicting opinions are what defines the true nature of Christian ministry. It's how it was meant to be. The conflict was intended. Don't think that there's something strange going on here. You know, there's arguments, you know, over the word uh, whosoever, okay? You know, I mean, you know, Steve, it says whosoever. There's arguments over the word all, all men, you know. People say grace isn't fair. You know, there's arguments over forgiveness and pleasing God and drawing near to God. I mean, the very things, though, that they offer up as a defense are things related to grace, not law. You know, it's kind of like a political party accusing another political party of doing the very things it's doing. It has always been a deep-seated concern of mine. And I've carried this on my shoulders for as long as I've been a Christian. And, and rightfully so. I, I should. And I thank God that I have. A concern for my brothers and sisters in Christ who are being harmed, who are being ruined, destroyed. Not, not destroyed in the sense that, you know, they go to hell. But their lives completely decimated over the seemingly innocent suggestion that we're under law as a rule of life. That unless we try, I mean, God reserves His best for those who mean business. God reserves His best for those who try. You know, and the harder we try, the more we try, the more we please God. The more God is pleased with us. You know, he has, his, he has His lazy Christians and He has His super Christians. You know, they got a big S on their chest with a cape. You know, I mean, these, these, these Christians, they fly. They're faster than a speeding train or a bullet. You know, I don't know, faster than a speeding locomotive. Well, you know, however that's. You know. And then you got your lazy Christians. Well, they don't ever. They don't. They don't study. They don't ever do anything. Have you ever stopped to consider that your brother in the Lord, who doesn't study, doesn't go to church, doesn't pray? doesn't tithe, doesn't do anything, doesn't even seem to love you very much, that He's still your brother in the Lord. And that He may be, have you ever thought that He may be at a, at a, at a, a crucial stage in His spiritual development where that God has placed Him in a desert of dryness and that for a purpose? to teach him to trust the Lord. But because you look at him and you don't see, he doesn't match up to your expectations of what you think a Christian ought to look like or be like or walk like or talk like, then there's got to be something wrong with him. Got to be. Because he ain't like you. Or he ain't like others. Do you realize the disservice that you're doing to this brother? Do you think that you're going to get him under grace by dumping more law, more, more responsibility on him that God never equipped him to, to carry, to, never intended that he bear? God's working in his life to bring him out of that system of that failed, miserable, failed system of law-keeping as a rule of life, 
and you're not helping very much. What God asks us to do is love them. That can be the hardest thing. It's easy to tell somebody, you know, man, you need to, you need to, you need to study more. You need to pray more. You need to go to church more. You need to witness more. You need to do this more and that more and that more. It's easy to do that. It's a lot harder to love them when they don't want to do any of that. It's a, it's a lot harder to love them sometimes. It's, it can be a lot harder to love them when it, it doesn't even appear that they love the Lord like you do. There's plenty. The Bible says, has plenty to say about us judging one another. What kind of irks me, you know, is whenever I, I tell another Christian, look, you're not under law, you're under grace. And so you're living the wrong way, you're walking down the wrong path, and immediately it's, well, Steve, you know, you're judging me. Stop judging me. Stop judging me. It's, it's Satan's reversal. It's Satan's counterfeit. It's Satan's masquerade. It's, he loves, our enemy, the devil, loves taking and turning things upside down and around, or around. He loves taking and making north-south, okay? And east-west. And it, it is utterly amazing the number of Christians, I mean, he, he must be working overtime, that he's gotten to believe, that he's, he's led to believe, or under law as a rule of life. Well, you know, we just, we got to solve the sin problem. It can't possibly be by grace. It can't possibly come about by trusting God alone in what he did, not what we do. It can't possibly be about a focus on Him and, and not ourselves because, man, we're a mess. We got to clean up our mess. We got to clean this mess up. We got to get with the program. And if we don't, God's not pleased with us at all. He's kind of res reserved a time for us, you know, in the woodshed. You know, He's got a woodshed back there. He's going to take you to it, you know, every time you mess up. You know, paddle your little behind, you know, get you on the right track. Bring stuff into your life to, to teach you that, well, teach you what? I've been talking to Christians for decades about this subject. I, I, it, seems like as it, it seems as if I've heard every argument. I know I haven't. There's, there's got to be some new ones out there too, you know, that, that, that Satan in, has recently, uh, you know, concocted. None of us knows, it, knows near what we think we do. But folks, it doesn't take a whole lot Okay, just a casual reading of Scripture will show you that our lives are to be like Him, but if we're going in the opposite direction of, in, of the way in which His life went, what, 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 what kind of sense does that make? If they persecuted, if they persecute you, it's because they persecuted me. If they hate you, it's because they first hated me. I don't know how to tell Christians. You know, the older I get, you know, it's, it seems like the the worse the problem gets, and that's that's an an important factor in all this. Not only, <coughs> not only does our outer man continue to decay and become more corrupt, the old man more cor corrupt day by day. God's not cleaning up the old man. 
the new man is being the new mind we're we're, we're undergoing a, a renewal of the mind it's being we're being changed into his likeness day by day dearly beloved where is your love where is your focus is it on yourself then well if you don't have time to, to be pointing the finger at yourself which you know a lot of Christians don't like doing that it's got to be the other guy it's got to be someone else Where's your focus? Is it on yourself or Christ? There is a simplicity to this whole argument, and that simplicity, folks, is Jesus Christ. It amazes me. I don't, I don't understand. I'm sorry. I just don't. I don't understand how any Christian can focus on their on self instead of Christ and call it Christianity. It just boggles my mind. I, I don't think God gave me the mental capacity to, to grasp that. I, I just, I don't get it. I mean, is He not our Lord or is He, is he our Lord or is He not? And just how much do Christians today know just what Christ did on their behalf and who they are in Christ. Their identity. D did you know that you have an identity? Folks, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have an identity. Just like you, you're a person who has an ID card. I, I hope you have one. I, you know, I, I went for years without one. There is a certain way that God looks at you. If you look at yourself in a different way than God looks at you, you're, you're not going to make much progress. We cannot make forward progress by clinging on to backward error. And our Lord is coming soon. He's coming soon. Some of you believe that. Some of you don't doesn't matter whether you believe it or you don't. I mean, you're believing it or not believing it doesn't change the fact that He's coming soon. And when He does, we're going to stand before Him and give an account for every single word we said. Every single word. Of course, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. I don't know why Christians want to spend so much time talking about hell and judgment and stuff. I mean, as if, you know, I mean, the, the family of God spends so much more time talking about the non family of God than the family of God. I, I don't know. I, maybe I didn't say that right. The church seems to spend a whole lot more time talking about the world than it does itself. It certainly doesn't minister to itself. What I see in the Word, when I study the Word, what, and as a, as a picture, you know, the picture that's developed for me, at least over the years, in my, in my studying of the Word, what I've seen is quite remarkable. It is a baseless argument to suggest that, that Christ, Jesus Christ, God Almighty, who became our kinsman redeemer, who died in our place and rose from the dead and lives within the, the, the believer, has, has come and t took up residence in the believer's life. The very triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, have taken up residence in our lives. That our conversation among ourselves is rarely about God at all. It's about us. It's about you. It's about you. It's about me. It's about this guy. It's about that guy. It's about what we need to do. It's very rarely do you ever hear any Christian just glorify God in his conversation. 
you know, it's easy to tell, you know, what, 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 what track, what path a Christian is on just by listening to his conversation. He's either going to be enraptured with the, you know, with every, the whole idea of what, who Christ is, what He did, what He accomplished on their behalf, how He's blessed them with every spiritual blessing in the, in the heavenlies. He's much more interested in, in, in Christ than self. I don't, I'm not, I don't think Christians in the norm, in the, basically in the norm, they get together and just have a, a big party, you know, a self-pity party or self-party, you know, where they just, hey, let's have a Bible study tonight. Let's gather together. Let's put the chairs in a circle. Let's all sit around. Let's just talk about our rotten self, okay, and how we ought to do this and that and how, you know, this guy needs to, you know, do this to get back on track, and this guy needs to do this to get back on track, and where the whole conversation is about Christ, except, well, we got to throw him in there somewhere. Uh, so it's with, with, with God's help. With God's help. By, by gosh, with God's help, I'm going to do it. You know, it's, God helps those who help themselves, right? I mean, I never get tired of talking about this subject. I could sit here all day, all night, all week, all month. I could just, I don't know, I might have to grab a, off the screen, go, grab a bite to eat or uh, eat while I'm talking to you. But folks, it is that important to me. I know it's, it's just as important to many others and I, and I have no doubt in my mind that the, the subject is important to God because the subject, the reality of it, the truth of it runs through Scripture like a golden thread. All you have to do is just take notice. Take note. Try this. Try opening up the New Testament. You know, somewhere, let's, let's just say Romans through Jude. Okay? Just open it up somewhere there. Shut, close your eyes and open, open it up somewhere between Romans and Jude and just point your finger, just point your finger uh, to a verse and read it and send it or send it to me. It'd be, that'd, be, that'd be a great idea. Send it to me. I'd love to, I'd love to know what, what verse that your, your little finger singled out because I can tell you for a fact you'd be hard-pressed to not find a single verse in the New Testament that deals with the subject that I'm talking to you about. The Holy Spirit has gone out on a limb to get the point across to us that we are God's people, that He loves us with an undying love, He's faithful even when we're not, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He's forgiven us of all our sins, past, present, and future. He's buried them in the, in the in challenger deep. He's cast them as far as the east is from the west, and that's pretty far, okay, when you think about it. He says he'll remember them no more. And yet Christian after Christian after Christian, their whole entire focus is on personal sin. How to, how to get rid of it, how to hide it, how to, how to whitewash it, how to clean up the old man, how to make ourselves more acceptable to God. Even though, never, never mind, forget the fact that the Word says we've been accepted in the Beloved. Oh, we got to, obedience brings blessings. No, no, actually, blessings brings obedience. If you really, if you want to be honest about it. I mean, if, if you want to say that right, you got to reverse it. Folks, we put the cart before the horse. This is nothing new goes all the way back to the epistle. We read about it in the epistle to the Galatians. Who hath bewitched you 
says Paul. I could ask the same thing of y'all today. Who's bewitched you? It certainly wasn't God. Well, I'm, uh, I, Steve, I'm I, this. I'm led by the Holy Spirit to tell you, you know that that you know we got to do the best we can. So, well, that's not the Holy Spirit leading you to say that. I could go on and on. I could probably waste y'all's time for another half hour. I'm going to let it go at this. This is Wednesday. I'll see y'all back here Sunday. Until then, know that we love you. We truly do. Rest in Him. If you don't know what Christ Jesus Christ has done for you, if you are hurting, if you are a hurting, despondent Christian, confused and doubtful about your own relationship, your own walk with the Lord, don't get discouraged, folks. If you were not His child, you wouldn't even care about that. I'll see you here next Sunday. Until then, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.